What's going on, Josh? How are you? I'm really good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. So I was saying to Josh that it's kind of a cloudy day in LA <laughs> and and I accused him of living a, in a cloudy place because I thought he was in Birmingham, UK. And then he told me that he moved to Tampa a month ago. So, so what, what, well, actually, let me just introduce you before we start rambling on here. You're a UK barber who now lives in Tampa, Florida. And you run, you run an education platform called DFS. And we're going to get into all that. But let's start with, why did you move? A multitude of reasons, partly the cloudy skies, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, but no, like, to be honest, the first time I ever came to America, I, I felt at home, like just in regards to the country. Um, I felt, I don't know what it was. I just felt like, I always feel like home is like an energy thing and home is where your energy feels the purest. And uh, the, the first time I came to America, I felt like that. I felt like I'd be, I was able to be me the most. Um, and then Tampa specifically, because... I have friends here that I, that I class holding up a, a whole close enough, sorry, as family. Um, and so it was just inevitable, really, especially with moving out to a different country. And I'm on the road a lot. So my wife, um, it's nice for her if I am away that she has like people that we class as family nearby. Then obviously it's also East Coast, meaning that the working day here is not too far away from the working day back at home because we still have a lot of business at home. And then also if I'm traveling, if I do have to get back to England, then I can get back the same day. If I was like, for example, where you are in LA, I'm not going to get back till tomorrow. So right. um, the East Coast was was uh, the obvious choice, but again, Tampa and then the weather too. Being from England and we, so we, we're so much used to this hot, the most boring weather possible. Um, mm -hmm. The sunny skies here and the heat was just, it was a no brainer for me. I love yeah. it. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I'm a fan of Florida. You know, a lot of people on the West Coast we disparage Florida, yeah. but I I don't really know why. Um, I I like yeah, it over there it. a lot. Yeah, I, I, I love it. And it's the, good energy. The, con the convenience makes a lot of sense to me. So so that's pretty exciting. So so far so good on Florida. Yeah, all good all good on Florida. Plus it's good for taxes too. So from a business standpoint, it's a good place to if we're going to choose to open a business in the U.S. and going to choose to have our holding company overall uh in like across the world it's going to be based in florida is one of the better places to base it so uh, no it doubt kind of just a, a smart choice all around really no doubt about that you got married about a year ago is that right that is correct yeah it was actually our wedding anniversary um i actually wasn't too far from you when it was our wedding anniversary it was our wedding oh. anniversary on the 28th and i was teaching a class in san francisco okay um, on unfortunately on the exact same day but <laughs> But uh, oh. it's because the way, our, the way our visas move, we were, we were supposed to move out in March. That's when we thought we'd be moving out. And we'd kept our anniversary free because the last two years, I've had to work on my birthday and we've had to work on my wife's birthday. So we were like, our anniversary, 100%, we're keeping free. Then our visa got put back. So we were like having to delay uh, a few classes. We put a few classes back and we had no other choice but to end up working on the anniversary day. So, but no, it, it, it was great. It was great. Well, isn't that just the way that it works for highly productive people? The reality is, the reality yeah. is that if you try to hold a special day free from work, very often <laughs> we end up working and and, and delaying yep. things like that. I remember when I got married; it was a number of years, what, thirteen years ago. Um, we didn't do a honeymoon for like a year and a half. One because mm -hmm. I didn't want to spend the money. And, and two, mm -hmm. I was, we were just too busy, both of us. So that's really cool. Congratulations on that. D did you marry an English girl or an American or something an else? English girl. Yeah, it's actually, okay. <laughs> no, an English girl. Yeah. So we, we actually grew up really, really close to each other. And then we worked together, um, a long time ago where we met, we met at work and we, we just selling, we worked in a shoe store, um, ah. selling shoes. And then we were together for a little while. Then we broke up for a little while. Cause it, and that kind of goes into when I started cutting hair too because I was, I was in quite a dark place when I started cutting hair. And I've always said that cutting hair kind of, it, it, it allowed me to become me uh, and it allowed me to grow a lot. And so we needed that time apart to sort of develop into the people that we needed to be. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we just found each other again. So it was actually quite a good story. Um, but yeah, 
as soon as we got back together, it was one of those ones. It's either we either it's going to be amazing, or we're going to end up getting married. Um, either it's not going to be great, or we're going to end up getting married. And as soon as we met back up again, we got our answer. So. Well, you know how we all here at the Hair Game Podcast love good stories, but I don't want to skip anything. So why don't we go back yeah. to to where you're from and what kind of kid you were? Wow. Okay. So I, I actually got told so there's a good story that kind of goes into this. So I'm from uh, a small town called Stourbridge in the UK. Um, it's it's just outside of Birmingham. So when I tell people who aren't from the UK or even not from kind of like near where I'm from where like when I talk about where I'm from I say Birmingham but I'm not from Birmingham and if you go to where I'm actually from there's actually a bit of a rivalry between where I'm from and Birmingham of course uh, mostly down to football or, or, or soccer um, of course so what, where, I'm, where I'm from is actually a small place called the, it's called the Black Country right and it's it's, called, it's named the Black Country because the old story goes that the Queen was driving past on the train the one day and because where I'm from was at like the heart of the Industrial Revolution uh, she couldn't see anything out of the the train window because it was everything was black, and so she named it the Black Country. So that's where I'm from. I'm from a small town in the Black Country. Um, and as a kid, I mean, I I was quite a, I w- I would have said I was quite a good kid. I, I think that my parents would probably say the same. But I think that I was a lot of the things that have come into fruition uh, later in life now make a lot more sense when I hear some of the stories about me as a child. So one of the things that my one of the good stories that describes me and my drive and motivation i think even from an early age was we had a a math test in school and every week apparently we used to do this test and i I must have only been like seven years old Uh, we used to have this math competition and every week i used to win every single week i used to win this because i used to make sure i practiced and practiced and practiced and i wanted to win it and then the one week apparently um i lost I, i came second and then i Apparently, it killed me, and I worked all week just practicing, practicing, practicing because I wanted to win the next week. And then the next week, the and I, I can vaguely remember this now, but my, my parents told me a story not too long ago. Um, I literally, literally peed myself to make sure that I won this test because apparently I needed the bathroom as this test was going on, but I needed to win. I wanted to finish first. I wanted to get it done, and I literally peed myself to win. So wow. I think that maybe goes into explain some of the determination and motivation that I have to, to work hard. Um, and yeah, little stories like that that happen when I'm a child make a lot of sense now. I think I was Tenacity. just I, I play, <laughs> yeah. I played Tenacious. sports a lot. I played sports a lot, and I was always determined to be the the best I could be. I think one of my school teachers, when I was um, when I was little, he said to my parents in like a parent meeting that if I was in the right environment and the right industry, I would be a great leader. And that made a lot of sense because I think I, as a kid, I was actually quite shy. I was quite a shy child. Like I, I wouldn't speak to adults when I was a kid. Um, I, I used to I used to have to feel very comfortable to excel. But if I did feel comfortable. I was very happy to try my best to excel. And I think that's one of what happened when I started cutting hair because I've always said that when I started cutting hair, the way I describe it is like I felt like I went home. And what I mean by that is like, you know when you go home after a long day of work and you kick off your shoes and you can just become the truest version of yourself. Any Mm. sort of facade that you have to put up for work or anything, you just drop it. That's how I felt when I started cutting hair. And so that makes a lot of sense with what that teacher said because it's like once I felt comfortable in that environment and I felt like I found the right industry, I just went full, uh, full pelt, um, and I've loved every minute since. Mm. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so before that, though, you you said that you were in a bad place, and clearly, uh, you were drawing a distinction um, uh, between hair and and being home versus maybe some discomfort with where you were before mm-hmm. that. So, so tell us about that. So I think it, it originated from, like I, I talk about connection to a purpose a lot. And I think that every human being needs to be connected to their purpose to really have that drive. Um, and so when I was younger, I played a lot of sports. Um, I was relatively successful at sports and I used to play cricket. And I, that was one of the sports. I played a lot of sports, but cricket was the one that I was really trying to go pro at. And I got, and it's kind of the same story that all like failed athletes have, which is I got injured, right? But I did, and I remember at 15, um, because I, I'm one of them, I believe in the fact that you, with discipline and, and, and kind of strategy with life, you're either disciplined across the board or you're not across the board. And at a young, throughout my childhood, I was so good and disciplined and as tenacious as we talked about um, that when I was practicing obviously sports, like academics, everything, I was just like full pelt giving everything I had. But then when I got injured, 
that was the start of a decline because I kind of, I'd lost that connection to a purpose. I'd, I'd lost why I was working so hard. Um, and I didn't realize it at the time. It was obviously very subconscious because as a child, I was not as emotionally uh, literate and I didn't really know what I was, I didn't know my emotions back then. But uh, I, I, and now I look back at it, I basically gave up because I couldn't play sports. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And my career that I'd looked to have was not an option. And so I, I became one of them people who put all of their sense of happiness in other people. And I'd actually become one of them kind of people where my, I, I thought I was being the most selfless that I could be in just trying to make everyone else happy. I'd kind of connected my purpose to everyone else's happiness. And I kind of was like, right, I'm going to make everyone I, I can be with happy. And so like my wife I'm with now, what I, in me thinking that I was just giving, I was actually taking, I was taking energy because obviously that's very draining to be around someone who's only going to be happy if you're happy. And I'd become that person. Um, and I was lost. I was, I went to study at university. So when I finished high school, I went to study at university, but I, at the, the option I chose was the easy get out. I went to go and try and be a, uh, a sports coach basically. And I thought, I don't want to do that. I want to have a bit more options. So I dropped that out. I went to, I, I took a year out and I worked for a year and I did read it, read it a few exams. I got into a really good university. Um, I got into a really good university. I studied geography. But, it, but I'd chosen it because I was good at it, because I was e it was easy to me. Um, and so I, it wasn't because I really wanted to do it. And I just felt lost and I felt like I had no purpose. It's not like that dramatic, like I wasn't in a bad place. Like uh, I, I lived in a, a safe place. I had a good family and I was just uh, surrounded by love. But I was like self-destructing in my own mind. I was creating my own dark place. And so what I, what I found was like I, I realized I didn't want to do university, but I didn't have any other options. So I carried on trying to do it. And that just led me to be in, I, I was just very anxious. I was an overthinker anyway. I'm naturally an overthinker, but I didn't have anything good to overthink. And so like the way I, I look back at my life now and I'm like, well, I realize now as an overthinker, that's, this is why hair saved me because it gave me something good to overthink. It meant if I mm. overthought hair, it channels it good because anyone who's an overthinker knows that once you finished overthinking, like I would overthink our relationship when I was, when I was young, which would destroy the relationship. I would, I, I would be so anxious, so essentially depressive that like, and as an overthinker, you know that if you're, when you finished overthinking, you kind of relax and you kind of go, well, that was stupid. You're like, I know I was being overdramatic. I know I was, I was kind of overthinking it and just creating a problem out of nothing. So that made me think like with hair, if I just overthink hair, if I overthink something that is going to create good at the end of it, my brain will relax at the end of it and I'll actually be a very chilled out person. Um, so yeah, so like I, that, that is what led me to cutting hair. What led me to cutting hair was essentially a bit of desperation in search of a purpose. But cutting hair ended up being by accident, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. How? Well, so, really quick, really quick. I, no. I just want to, I just want to talk about the meta nature of how you're thinking about overthinking. I just, yeah. I enjoy that <laughs> tremendously yeah. to hear your description of your analysis of overthinking. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but it's amazing. And of course, everybody, all the listeners understand that. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be a percentage of our listeners who are overthinkers mm -hmm. and they're going to appreciate hearing somebody else's perspective on it because it's something that's not discussed a lot. I, mm -hmm. I definitely experience it because um, I probably used to be an overthinker and I think I overthought my overthinking and now I, <laughs> I, I have a proper, you know, amount of thinking on things, mm -hmm. but I can see that my kids are definitely overthinkers and it, it, yeah. it can create a struggle out of things that shouldn't 100%. so much be. The thing for me is I, I, I firmly believe that I can't really ever change who I am. I can do, I can work with some tactics and some training to maybe coach myself into certain ways of thinking. But I think to be perfectly honest, to get the best out of anybody, you've got to just compliment and enhance who you are rather than trying to change it. So for me, I've never tried to change the fact I overthink. I think the more, and because that's from experience, the more I used to try to not overthink and hate myself for overthinking, the more I would end up panicking about it and getting anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the moment I realized if I let myself overthink, but just channel it well, I actually become a relaxed person. And, and I, I think a lot of people go through this where they are trying to, because I did it, trying to change yourself, trying to think, I don't want to be this person who overthinks. But as I said, like, it's just the way my brain works. My brain, if I don't overthink or if I try not to, eventually at some point, 
throughout the day, there'll be a period where I'm just overthinking stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's where, to me, I'm like, I've got to tie my brain out. I know I need to tie my brain out. But I think that part that's partly what goes into the, that sort of like tenacity and relentlessness that I kind of have is just a case of like actually just trying to make myself be in a good place mentally mm-hmm. and feed it, giving itself the right food essentially. But mm-hmm. back to the cutting hair. So the reason it was an accident was I was in this dark place. I didn't have a purpose. I, I we, this is ju- like so me and my wife we were, were together now obviously we broke up just after I started cutting hair but it was at the point when I started to cut hair it was at that point where it was kind of going anyway like I think we needed to part ways to to become the people that we needed each other to be um, and so I remember it was New Year's Eve and I really needed a haircut this is like probably eight years ago so it was New Year's Eve I really needed a haircut and I just hadn't booked myself in. I was that person who just didn't book themselves in and tried to just walk in and get a haircut on New Year's Eve. So that was clearly not going to happen. And I remember my dad had a pair of clippers in the in the bathroom. And the words I actually said to myself genuinely was, it can't be that hard. So I tried to cut my own hair. It was genuinely the Fate, worst haircut words, I've ever had. Right? You'll, you'll, you'll yeah. always <laughs> remember thinking that. You'll always re- And, and yeah. I love moments like that. I remember. I remember staring at myself in the mirror being like, it can't be that hard and putting like a zero line in, trying to fade it. It was the worst haircut I ever had and I had to wear a hat that New Year's. But to be, it sounds really weird, but the sound of the clippers, like the crunch when it took the hair off, it just had me hooked like that. It just, I was just curious. Like I was just curious to see if I could do it on someone else now. That's what the initial thought was. I remember just thinking like, I need to do more of this. Hearing the sound and the crunch of the clippers, it just got me like, I need to do more of this. The crunch of the clippers. I mean, I love that so much. That's yeah. just so visceral. I mean, yeah. it's like, you, you, you know, you're very mental, you're introspective, you're all these things that you're telling us about, but that one is physical. Like you yeah. hear, you know, that sensory kind of thing is, I just love how visceral that is. And you yeah. remember that moment at which that sense was so int- intriguing to you. I love ne- that. And, and I get it, by the way, because, of course, uh-huh. I get my haircut and, yeah. and I hear that. That's amazing. Yeah, I, it was literally that I never forget it because it was some, they were like, they weren't very good clippers. They were like essentially the equivalent to like Walmart clippers. And so I remember that when I turned them on, the, they made such a loud noise. It was like a real like that. And like you hear the, the, the crunch and I just remember, I can physically remember looking at myself in the mirror and being like, ooh, there's something about this that just, again, intrigues me. So I remember, bear in mind, so at this point I'm still at university technically. I'm still enrolled anyway. Um, I didn't want to be there, but I was still enrolled. And literally that week I was like, let, I said to my, my brother, uh, my dad, can I cut your hair? My dad said no straight away at first. My <laughs> brother said yes, because my brother was young. I tried my brother's hair and to be perfectly honest, and I've never ever like liked to, I don't like to sort of like blow my own trumpet, so to speak, but it wasn't even that bad is what <laughs> I would say. Like it, it really wasn't that bad when I cut, cut my brother's hair. And because it can't have been that bad because my dad let me try his straight after, huh? after he saw what I did to my brother. So Amazing. I remember I did that and then straight from there, I went to university, signed the essentially the release papers and was out straight away. Um, wow. As soon as I... I just knew, and I remember my parents. They weren't they weren't too pleased to be perfectly honest. And it wasn't. I mean, I fully understand because up until that point, from when I was doing sports to then, I'd been that kind of person who would try everything in between for like a month and then give it up because I didn't I didn't want to do it. So I understand why they were scared because they knew at that point that I may well be doing another one of my ideas. So they they weren't too happy. But I remember saying to them, and again, it's something else I remember vividly is I just remember saying to them, look. I don't know what you can make it as in this industry, but I promise I'm going to make it as something. That's all I said. Because I didn't know what was in this industry. I didn't know you could teach. I didn't know you could do any of what I do now. I just knew that hair was my vehicle. That's all I knew. I just knew I'd found the vehicle to take me to where I wanted to go to build a life that I, I was going to enjoy. Because as I said, it just made me feel like I was at home. When I started cutting hair, it made me feel at home because it stopped my overthinking. Because when you're cutting hair and you're behind the chair, you don't think of anything else other than the hair. That's the only thing that matters. Everything else just goes away just for that moment. And so the description I use is like, imagine I was in a dark tunnel and then like barbering and cutting hair. It just moved a few rocks. It didn't like show me the light and like open the door. It just showed me a few rocks. 
And I think that's the thing when anyone finds their purpose and passion, people talk about it like it's about, you know, it showed them the way and it gave them a, gave them that happiness. No, you've still got to take it. You've still got to go and remove the rocks yourself. You've still got to take that, that chance of happiness. And that's where like you can't just find something you enjoy. You've got to really like seize the moment with it. And that's what I did. Uh, from that moment, I was just like pedal to the metal, essentially. I, I was like, I gotta get good. I gotta get good as fast as I can. I remember like considering like, do I do apprentices? Do I do this and that? And I just was like, I'm gonna essentially. I tried. I shot myself around a little bit, and then just was like, I can do this myself. And I just cut hair in my mom and dad's kitchen. I just came in my mom and dad's kitchen for about three, four months. And at that point, I was marketing myself by going and getting my hair cut in other shops, local shops that weren't the greatest shops in the world, but I knew I might have a chance of getting a job there. And I was showing them my work, showing them my social media. And I got I got a job, uh, and then that rest the rest was history. Really, it was just I just remember every single haircut I ever did. I would study it, study the hell out of it. Like I would take photos, even if I hated it, I'd take photos and I would just write down things down: what I like, what I don't like, why I like it, why I don't like it, what I think I could do better, what I think I could like, how could I improve it, what could I do again? And I just was so I spent so much of my time just thinking about hair. And, and studying hair, that it just became my life. And I love that. I love that it became my life. Yeah. So you're, you have a restless mind that just <laughs> is, that you know, this sounds so cheesy, but I'm going I'm to use this word yearns. It, it you know, yeah. it wants so badly to think about something. And, and I think people who do important things, uh, g- good and bad, you know, mm-hmm. that they, they, they're kind of like this. And, mm-hmm. but of course, it, in order to be one of the ones who does productive things in yeah. life, you know, you need a good place to channel it. And, mm-hmm. and that's what you were so uncomfortable before you found a good place to channel all this kind of introspection and, and mm-hmm. thinking and you found hair and it captivated you. And that's so amazing. Um, you know, and of course, a lot of people in this industry have a similar feel about it, mm-hmm. and they have a similar origin story about how they got into the industry. Now yeah. and then, unfortunately, you have people in our industry who are like, "Gosh, I don't know if I felt that way about mm-hmm. here. I ended up here in another way, yeah. and maybe I maybe this is not the best place for me. I mean, you probably stand in front. I know that that you uh, teach. You you have an educational mm-hmm. platform, so you stand in front of a lot of people, probably thousands over the years. And mm-hmm. have you ever encountered somebody who's like, "Gosh, maybe this isn't the right place for me"? What do you say to them? Yeah, I actually have. So I've when I do my classes. So as you can probably imagine, I I, I mean, I only spent take like five to ten percent of my classes on this, but like I always make sure that before the class begins in regards to technicalities and, and talking about hair and processes and stuff like that, I always spend a bit of time talking about personal development, talking about strategy, talking about getting to know your own psychology, talking about like connecting to your purpose. Because what I like to make sure people do is I like to make sure that people actually give themselves the best chance to use what they're going to learn. Because what it is, is most people, they, they, they don't I, they're not actively thinking a lot. So they'll go to classes and they'll just expect to get better just because they're at the class. Whereas it's like, just because you invest the money to be at the class doesn't mean you shouldn't invest the time afterwards to use what's in the class. And so I talk about this because I want people to really start to develop and actually own and be empowered in their development. But because I'm talking about all this stuff, I'm talking about connecting to a purpose, I'm co- talking about like sort of like the real reason they're there, um, talking about like their personal development, like their life, their discipline, their strategy. You will have, like I've had, it's only like, 0.01% maybe, but over the years, I've had a couple of people tell me like, man, like I, I don't think I love it like you do. And I'm, not, and I'm like, that's, that's completely fine. Like all life is about in reality is you living the best life you can and you being fulfilled because fulfillment, I, I took about many times, but as human beings, energy is our currency, right? So energy, like everything we do in life is a transaction of energy in some form. And the energy you put out is the energy you receive. And if the energy you put into what you do is the energy it's received with. So if you're not putting the love for our industry into what you do, it won't be received like that anyway. So it's going to be very, very hard to build a successful career in the hair industry if you don't love hair. That's the first ingredient of it. And so I talk to people like this all the time. Like I actually do 
um, a lot of like personal mentoring as well, right? like not just hair mentoring. I do um, mentoring to people outside the industry as well. And I talk to them a lot like about that kind of stuff. It's like, it doesn't matter what you want to do. You just got to find out what it is that makes you feel good the most. Having a consciousness over your own emotions is the most important thing in life. It's something that humans don't do very often. It's something I didn't do for a long time. But keeping a track of what inspires you, what makes you feel good, where do you get fulfillment from? Because if cutting hair alone doesn't make you feel good, it's going to be—it's basically just a job. If it—if you don't get some sort of intrinsic satisfaction, and it's also a case of you've got to maintain that too. So just because you. Um, are working behind the chair every day you've got to keep some of this industry for yourself so barbering or cutting hair in general is it's a passion but it's also a job and I think a lot of people fall into the trap of what I call psychological burnout which is where you you stop getting fulfillment from something you once had fulfillment from so for me it's not always a case that they just don't love it it's a case of like in any relationship you might have like personal relationships like uh, romantic relationships if you don't consistently strive to get new experiences and to do new things and to go new places right eventually you'll become psychologically burnt out together and the relationship might break down because you've got to work at it and it's the same with your relationship with the industry you're in you've got to work at it you've got to consistently push yourself to maybe get a bit better to try new things try different techniques go and learn a different side of our industry um, and do all these kind of things to be able to keep that potential for fulfillment because fulfillment is it's an amazing thing, but fulfillment is only fulfillment if it's as good as, if not better than last time. That's why like, I always talk about being addicted to fulfillment is the best addiction you could ever have because it works like a drug. It literally works like a drug. It's only going to give you the same hit if, you, if it's as good as or better than what you've had before. And so in our industry, a lot of the time, if you're only cutting hair behind the chair, you're going to find it very, very, very hard to maintain fulfillment like you did at the beginning because at the beginning, everything's new. Everything's a new experience. But as you progress through that, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be very... What's going on? They're <laughs> cheering. They're cheering what you're saying. <laughs> but it's going to be very hard. Like, it's going to... That, that threw me so much then. I was like, is that coming from <laughs> Sorry. me? But, um, <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. But yeah, it's, so they, they really need to... Like, because again, and that's what I talk... When, I, when people I talk to me about maybe they don't love it quite so much, first, I want to find out the root of it. Is it that you don't love it? Or is it that you only cut hair behind the chair? The, the best advice I ever tell people is just do one haircut a week for yourself. So you take out the paying customer, take out the time restraints, take out what they're, what you're supposed to be behind the chair and just do a haircut for you. And it'll be the best investment you ever have because that's the time I'm talking about investing. You can invest all the money you want in all the classes you want in learning all the new things you want. But if you don't give yourself the time to just love what you do, you won't love what you do. And again, that's where like relationships, you have to have certain times where maybe you go on vacation or you have a, a date night or you do specific things where there's time dedicated to just that yeah. relationship. And yeah. I think the relationship with yourself, but also the relationship with your industry is so important. And then if it's not for you, it's not for you. And we find out what industry is for you or even it might be a case of you like hair, but it's not what you love. For example, I'm not the person who wants to cut behind the chair every day. That's not me. But some people are. Some people love just working behind the chair and they wouldn't want to teach or they wouldn't want to travel. They wouldn't want to do any of that. But some are vice versa. And there's so many avenues of our industry you can go down, especially now with social media, that you don't even have to literally love cutting hair for hair to be a vehicle. You could have a different avenue of hair that is your vehicle, which is super cool. And that's why I think it's one of the best industries in the world because we're all so different and what makes us fulfilled is so different. And uh, being different is the most beautiful thing we have in common. It's just... Mm. Uh, and I, that's why I love it, and that's why I love speaking to people who who are in this industry. I know I went off on a little tangent there, but but like yeah. uh, I think it's so important for people to to hear stuff like this. Absolutely, and I love your analogy to relationships because it reminds me of something that I saw yesterday. I'm not even making this up, but I saw on online somewhere yesterday. It might have been Instagram. And it's the the post, it was a motivational, I guess, uh, type of post. And mm -hmm. it said that in relationships, you can, you can foster and nurture your relationship to make it better, or you can make these little micro decisions to, to not do that. And the mm -hmm. relationship will slowly get suff suffocated 
and mm-hmm. likely not be so good. And so it, it drew comparisons between, you know, making those little micro decisions in a positive way or the micro decisions in a negative mm-hmm. way. For example, when you come home from w- whatever and your wife is at home, I- I'm saying this from the perspective as a husband, because mm-hmm. I am, um, and y- you walk in and your wife is on the couch, you know, do you just walk in and then, you know, go to the other room and put your bag down or whatever and then go to the kitchen? Or do you walk in and you go say hi to your wife? Mm-hmm. Right? The little micro decisions. And of course, yeah. on the flip side of that is if you're a wife in the other room or whatever, when your husband comes home, do you go out there and, you know, say hi and give him a hug and a kiss? Or do you just stay doing what you're doing? And so mm-hmm. these little these little micro decisions um, foster and build a relationship in a positive way. And, and another example that this uh, little piece of content had was when you guys are, let's say, whatever, on the couch, and you know, are you both on your phones individually, kind of mm-hmm. doom scrolling, you know, separately for <laughs> two hours? Or, you know, do you have your hand on her leg? Or are you showing some little yeah. micro kinds of affection? And those yeah. little things are important. And sometimes you may not feel like doing them. And this is going back mm-hmm. to your point, just kind of reinforcing your point. Sometimes you need to, quote, work on something, right? Work on yeah. hair or work on a relationship. And that simply may be um, little tiny decisions like, you know, do you have your arm around your wife? You know, when you're sitting on the couch, mm-hmm. you might be doom scrolling, but you're doing it with your arm around her. And that's a little bit different, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. I think that, so for me, like, uh, the phrase I use a lot, and obviously you can, you after speaking to me a little bit, you might be able to see where this is coming from in my point of view, but I think it's in general. For me, a lot of people, we overcomplicate life by not overcomplicating it, if that makes sense. I know it sounds mm. kind of crazy, but by mm. not thinking about the small details, we actually overcomplicate life. Life is so easy, but what we're often doing is missing the small things. Mm. Life is so easy to do right, it's just, it's so also so easy to miss because it's the smallest details, like you said, the micro details that actually matter. So mm-hmm. it's like, the way I look at it is, uh, I try to, so my analogy of balance, right? Because if you talk about balance and you go to a lot, I've spoken about this on uh, many of podcasts, but if you talk about balance, balance to most people, they think of time, they instantly think of time. They think of, I'm gonna balance my time between work and life. I'm gonna balance my time between my wife, for example, for me, and, uh, I don't know, social media or like between this and that. But in reality, like balancing time is one of the stupidest things we could ever try and do because you're never going to do it. It's impossible to balance time. And if we allow people to expect that balance of time, we then create potential negatives in our relationships because it is the expectation that we allow people to have. If, if it, that's not met, that's what causes the negative emotions. So, and it's just communication. So what, what I like to think about balance is instead of balancing time, I want to balance moments. I want to balance fulfillment because I've got like five key areas realistically in my life I need to balance and that's my ability technically in my career uh, in regards to my profession, my career opportunities, financial, personal and emotional. And our emotional is what I'm going to give, personal is what I'm going to gain. Now I've got five things to balance. So balance to me is a case of all these five areas just need to have the appropriate levels of fulfillment. They don't need the same amount of time to fulfill them all, right? So what's going to fulfill one area doesn't take up the whole day but one may. So the idea of that is I'm never going to do that in one day. But what I could do and what I can do a lot of the time is balance one week. So I actually change our expectation and perception of balance. So instead of trying to balance a day, instead of trying to communicate, okay, cool, so today I'm going to work till here and then we're going to do this. I'm not saying we never, ever, ever do that. But generally, I'm, my, my, my life's impossible to do that with. Most people's lives are impossible to do that with, especially now with social media and work being more remote so you can be working at any time. I'm like, let's balance a week. So during this week, we might only have one day where we get a good amount of time together, but we'll use that time to go and create some moments. Because like time, when you, as you said, when you're you're spending time with people, what do you do? You're just scrolling on social media, you're watching TV, you're doing something else when you spend time. It's important, more important to create moments because moments last forever, whereas time's gone in an instant. So the moments is what creates fulfillment, creating special moments across all areas of your life. Now, sometimes I might only get to balance a month. Now, if I only get to balance a month, maybe instead of doing something nice on one day, we might go away for two days or three days. But in reality, for me and my wife, we might get the same level of fulfillment as someone might get, probably more fulfillment than someone might get if they try to spend equal time every day. And especially in the hair industry, it's so prevalent because in a lot of, like, 
well, I say like normal industries, but I mean like more office-based jobs, for example, people can go to work nine to five and go home and disconnect from work. So they can balance time a little bit better. But I think your balance, of, your balance has to be down to you and your life, not social expectations. Because in our industry, the thing is, we all love hair, right? And we, the way a hair industry works is you'll go home after cutting hair all day. And then you probably have to go and go on social media to reply to any messages or any networking you need to do. Then you might want to post a, a, po- a photo or a video. Then you might want to watch some YouTube and learn something or watch an online academy and do, do some education. Now, to you as a, hair, as a hair artist, for example, that would be highly fulfilling because you get fulfillment from that. But your family won't. So that's not balance. And even though you're sat with them watching TV, you're doing something different. It's not present. So, and the reason I talk about it so much to barbers and hairstylists is because the only time really you cut hair badly, the only time you cut hair really badly is when something is stressing you in a different area of your life. When you've got other stresses, it takes your mind away from that haircut and you do the hair not as good as you could. So the reason I've talked so much about it, even in our classes, we put it in our classes, is because if you can't gain balance across your life, you won't cut hair as well as you want to cut hair. You won't go through your career as well as you want to go through your career. And I think the barbers need to think a lot more about that kind of stuff. We just fixate so much on hair, we forget that the people we're with, the people in our life, don't like hair that much (laughs) like we do. They don't get it. So we're never going to get that balance. And I think that the balance is super, super important for everybody. Mm. That's fascinating. I love that. Okay, so you made reference to, and I had written down a question before we started, that uh, obviously you're an educator and you not Mm -hmm. just uh, deal with the technical, you don't just deal with the technical, Mm -hmm. but you deal with the psychological, the emotional, uh, the mindset is the word that I used here because uh, I got that sense from you and, and, and what I learned about your classes. Mm-hmm. What is, and you do your classes through DFS. Tell us what DFS is. So the DFS formula is our process of cutting hair. So that's um, our unique process of cutting hair. We actually, because I taught myself to cut hair. Um, and so I essentially, through trial and error, created a relatively hybrid process of hair cutting. It, it has the precision um, and the detail uh, and the control of cosmetology and hairdressing but it still has the efficiency and logicalness of barbering. And what I mean by that is, like, the reason I, think, I feel like our industry specifically needs it is because in, in the barbershop, it's such a different environment to the hair salon. And what I mean by that is, like, typically, on average, like, the hair salon will have, like, an hour, 45 minutes to an hour to do an appointment, and they're only really going to cut off this much hair, probably, and there's going to be no clipper work on a, on a lot of the haircuts. And... When it comes to barbers, then they're trying to, the only way to really do precision and longer lengths is with cosmetology techniques. And like any education system, as society develops, it needs a reform because with the, the, the fashion trends getting sent across the world now in an instant for the social media, longer stars are trying to work into the barbershop. But the barbershop environment is still, on average, a 30 minute appointment. That's the average appointment time for a barbershop. So, and a lot of barbers are between 20 minutes to 40 minutes. So it's somewhere between there. So I'm using 30 as the average. And they're trying to do a whole haircut and fade or taper and, and blend from shorter hair, but they've only got half the time. And so like what we find is that barbers are really struggling to do the cosmetology techniques on the whole. Like some do and some will, and that's great. And I'm not saying it literally for everybody can't do it, but it's a case of on the whole, barbers are struggling to do cosmetology techniques in a barbershop time frame you'll find that barbers who can have an hour appointment, they might be okay. But they've got a fade as well, so even they struggle sometimes. And that, I'm, this is from speaking to them. I know that they struggle. And so to me, I had, this, I had this process anyway. It's what I've always used. And the more I started teaching, I never intended on the DFS formula becoming what it is. Obviously, when I first started doing teaching, I was doing a lot of creative haircuts. And people used to come to me at the end of the class, and they would be like, right, I loved the haircut, but what you did there, how you did it, like, do you normally do it that way? Like in the shop? I was like, yeah, of course I do. And they were like, no way. And I was like, a light bulb was like, okay, cool. So let me put this into a formula. Let me put this into a curriculum. Let me put it into something that's actually digestible and teachable. And then that was like five, six years ago. And we've just developed it ever since. And we keep developing it. This is the thing, like for me, I'm always, I'm always listening to what the students are saying. If there's ever we get feedback about like, how does it work like this? How does it work like this? We take it and we use it to develop because I'm trying to get to the point where we can help the industry the, as most as possible. And so like, yeah, the DFS one to sum it up is just, it's honestly probably the easiest way to do a haircut in the world, but it gives you the same precision as traditional cosmetology. What does DFS stand for? 
stands for. So obviously to know what it act to what it, what goes within it, you have to be in a yes. class. But what it actually stands for is D stands <laughs> yes. for dominant growth pattern, F stands for foundations, and S stands for style. Um, so it's oh. dominant growth pattern, foundation, style. And that is like the system uh, of a haircut. Now, the thing with the formula is, yes, it's a process. And what we first taught when I first started teaching it, I've always believed in giving everything you've got. So when I first did our education on this, obviously it was very, very, very simple version of what we teach now because I was learning along with everyone else. I was trying to see how this would develop. Um, so what started as that simple system has now become that system, but like on steroids. So it's now like that, but it's the same thing. It's, it does the, how we do it, exact same as it always has been, but like we can now teach it in a way that gives you that real control. Where when we first started teaching it, I used to find that people would be like, great, I can see that works for you. Whereas the more we've developed it now, as soon as people see it, they're like, I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna use it because they can see the power it provides them. Because it's the kind of system that allows, it's an, rather than normally, haircutting to me is a very much a recipe book. And you typically follow the recipe to do that haircut. And But the problem with the recipe book, the problem is it doesn't cater to everyone's taste buds. So what I mean by that is a recipe is a recipe and it's going to work. For example, with haircutting, it will work if the head looks like that diagram. That's when it will work best. On everyone else, it will have to be tweaked and developed. But no one teaches how to tweak and develop it. They just teach the haircut. But we, would, we don't want to focus on teaching the haircut. I want to focus on teaching how to cut hair. Right, because what it, your ability and how good you are, it's about how well you can adapt what you do, not just what you can do. Just because you can do a haircut on a mannequin and make it look like that, when someone comes in with different growth patterns, different textures, different densities, right, different head shapes, it's not going to look like that. And if people get confused and think that they're terrible, whereas it's not, it's just they're not being taught enough. I think that the the the, the hair industry and the, the and I get it, the recipe book's good, right? But what do the best chefs in the world do? best chefs in the world don't follow recipes the best chefs in the world can take the can understand how to cook they know the fundamentals of cooking and then how spices work and they understand the recipes and then they adapt it for every single dish they're going to do and they create that one and so for me what i want to allow hairstylists and barbers to do is to understand how to create a recipe for every person who's in their chair because that's what needs to happen because every head's different and i think that if you can do that in the efficiency time frame that we do it in it's a no-brainer yeah Wow. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, so Josh, I can tell that this is going to, I definitely want to give you two episodes. We have a lot more to talk about. So let's stop it. I hate to do this because mm -hmm. I always feel like I'm interrupting what you're saying. You're on a flow and everything. But let's stop it. And then we're going to come back next week and keep going um, to give the listeners two episodes. How does that sound? Sounds perfect to me. I can't wait. <laughs>